Good morning and welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us on this not icy Sunday morning. I was a little worried about that, but uh, thanks be to God. Unfortunately, I have to start the service with a word of just sadness over the situation going on in Ukraine. I hope that you all continue to hold them in your prayers as I do. Um, and indeed, maybe some of you remember from about 20 years ago, uh, Cheryl had an, uh, excuse me, an exchange student from Ukraine, Tanya, and she's got a little update for us on her. Yes, Tanya was our exchange student in 2001, 2002, and she, she reached out to me for help on Wednesday um, when she evacuated Kiev with a group. Her, all the men stayed behind to fight, and, but she evacuated to a village. I'm not sure exactly where, but she said they're safe and have food and water and heat. Um, they originally were hoping to get to Poland and then fly to Mexico because they don't have a visa requirement there and then get to the United States. But that plan has, is no more right now because it's just too dangerous for them to travel from the village they are to Poland or anywhere. So there's, they're safe in that village for right now. I asked her if she needed anything, if there's any way to help her besides prayer. And she said, that is the best thing. They have everything they need, but um, I will let you know if there's any other way we can help. But she said everyone's thoughts and prayers really sustain them during this super difficult, difficult time. Thank you. Thank you for the update and, and sharing with us. Uh, so I'd like to begin our service this morning with a, a quick prayer for Ukraine and then a moment of silence. So let's pray. Lord God, we pray for your guidance and your, your help in the midst of this moment of war. Uh, we pray that peace might be found, that hostilities might end, that leaders might make new decisions. We pray for all those people suffering in the midst of this uh, violence. Please be with them and offer them healing and support. Amen. I encourage you to continue to hold Tanya and all the people of Ukraine and Russia in your prayer as time goes on. Hopefully it will end soon. But for now, I invite you to please rise for our gathering hymn, Just a Closer Walk with Thee.
Please be seated. We come now to the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. children. We, we have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in the good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Amen. The grace of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the reconciling love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. If you'd please rise now, let's sing together our Kyrie. Together, let us pray. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together our gospel acclamation.
A reading from the Gospel of John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Please be seated. As you can see, it's a bit of a, a long lesson this morning, and I wouldn't make you stand through all of that. Um, also, I'm going to be stopping as we go through uh, to talk about uh, some of the things we encounter. Um, so I hope that you can continue to follow along. I'll try and uh, remember to say the verses when I'm picking back up. All right, so we've got Jesus. We continue to follow Jesus uh, as he is moving around the country and engaging the Pharisees, and we have another situation coming up. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Now, I'm going I'm to stop right there. I know that's the middle of, a, of an early verse, but this is actually a bad translation, and it's kind of confusing. You might, you might hear the, the problem. So it says, he was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. But that's not what the Greek says. The Greek doesn't say that he was blind so that God could look good. The, the, the Greek actually, the, the NRSV translation just sort of fills that in because they have a little bit of a hard time with it. But it should read something more like, he was born blind, full stop, right? Now, God's work might be revealed in him. The blindness wasn't because God needed him so that God could heal him. The blindness is just there. It's not really explained in the text. So let's be clear. God did not inflict blindness on this man in that way. He just was blind. And now, God's work can be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now I'm going to stop again. I apologize. But so if you recall in John's gospel, whenever we hear that statement, I am, this is a, a hearkening back to that moment of the burning bush the, when God describes God's self as I am the great I am, Yahweh, right? So this is not a, a, a not so subtle hint of Jesus saying, I am one with God, right? So he's using that same statement because God in the Old Testament doesn't have a name. It just is, I am who I am. That's what Yahweh means. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. And we get that same I am statement several times within John's gospel. But this is one of those moments where Jesus is, the subtext is not very sub, right? I am, I am God. And I am the light of the world. Now back on verse 6. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him be before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, it is but someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. So I'm going to stop there for just a little bit, because we've got an interesting situation here. This is a, a, a pretty significant dilemma for the Pharisees, for the, the scholars and the, the scribes, the, the ministers of the day, right? Because they have a, a very legalistic sense of their own righteousness. If you follow the rules, you are good. And if you're good, God blesses you. Therefore, if something has gone wrong, you must have sinned because God is punishing you for that sin. This is a concept called retributive justice. The idea is if you do something wrong, God will punish you immediately, right? And this is a concept that we still have in our world today, even though more than once Jesus refutes that very idea. But many Christians still think that way because it is a very handy way to explain the universe, to explain creation, to explain why some people are suffering and others are not, right? It's easy to say, well, this bad thing is happening to you because you're a sinner. And then I have no responsibility for you. It's your problem. You did the wrong thing, so God is punishing you. I don't have anything to do with it, and therefore I don't have to help you in any way, right? It is very tidy. 
And we see that all around us. People think that way. They think you're getting what you deserve. But this man born blind refutes all of that, that whole idea. And Jesus, I think quite intentionally, healed this man's blindness on the Sabbath to kind of put his thumb in the eye of this way of thinking, this worldview, right? Jesus is saying, yes, the rules are there and they're helpful. And indeed, many people do get punished for their sins because it's the natural consequence of acting foolishly, right? But that's not something that's coming from God. God is not sending down a punishment. This man was not born blind because his parents sinned or because he sinned. He simply was born, born blind, right? And so he's saying... The rules aren't the point. We have the rules to help us live together, but the love we share is the point. The rules are there to help us love one another, to care for one another, to live together as God's people. They are not the be-all and the end-all, and that seems to be what the Pharisees have forgotten. They've made this type of righteousness, this legalistic righteousness, the whole point of their faith. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Your worldview is twisted. You've forgotten what it's all about. And so intentionally, he heals this blind man on the Sabbath to cause a stir. And they can't figure it out, which it seems strange to us maybe in our modern context, but how can a, a good man do something on the Sabbath, right? That shouldn't even be possible if their worldview Uh, were to make sense, if they were to try to hold on to it. Because by its very nature, it's a bad thing to do. You're you're doing work on the Sabbath. You're going against God's commandment. So you can't do something good out of something bad. That doesn't seem to make sense to them. That's why they're having such a hard time with this. That's why they're they're arguing and fighting. And some people are saying, oh, you're you're taking it too seriously. Obviously, he's a good man. And other people saying, no, no, no. He He must be evil because he's done something on the Sabbath. Does that make sense? Do people see the conundrum that they've run into? All right, we'll we'll continue. Uh, This is verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Asked him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. This is, this is kind of a challenging moment too, right? You would think his parents would stand up for him, right? And they are in their way, but in their limited power within this situation. One of the reasons that we tend to hold on to our worldviews, the way we see things, the way we've explained things, is because they give us authority, right? They give us power. They give us, oftentimes, prestige. That's certainly true for the Pharisees, and and they want to hold on to that, right? They see this as a threat to their way of understanding the universe, their way of understanding creation, of understanding God. And so they, they they, they have to label Jesus as wrong, and therefore they need to label this guy to somehow undermine his testimony, to say he's got to be wrong too, or there's got to be a trick here or a lie here because it doesn't work with the way we understand things. And even the parents can't fall into that. They don't have the power to stand up to the temple, to stand up to the Pharisees and the temple police. They have their own physical force to enforce their will in the world. I like to think that if we encountered this out in the world today, if we encountered Jesus and saw him heal someone just on the street, we would be ecstatic, right? We would be excited. But I think even within our own way of seeing the world, we'd probably be suspicious, right? We'd say, this is a trick. This is set up. I mean, we've seen enough, uh, let's say, faith healers that were, that were shams, right? We, we know that people pull these kind of tricks in the world. We would be suspicious too. So I guess I, I don't want us to say, oh, clearly the Pharisees are evil, right? They're wrong. They're, no, they're acting from their own understanding. And they're trying to do the best they can. Are they kind of jerks about it? Yes. They could be better. They could be, they could be kinder. But they're doing what they can with the way that they understand things. And Jesus is turning everything on its head. So I guess I want to say, don't be too quick to label them, but try and understand where they're coming from and the mistakes that they're making. Because I think they're very natural mistakes. It's just how they think things work. They just happen to be wrong. And I've been wrong before. I was wrong just the other day. <laughs> um, and 
sometimes it's hard to see how wrong we are when we're so caught up in our own way of thinking, right? And that's where they are. And Jesus is doing all that he can, and, and they're stubborn. They want to hold on to that, that way of seeing the world because it, it gives them a lot of power and prestige. But it's, it's a hard change. All right, let's, let's continue on. This is verse 24. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his eyes. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. So this just goes back to their understanding of the world, right? You were born entirely in sin, because that was the only way they could explain his blindness. But it doesn't work anymore, this, this condemnation, because he can see. God, even in their own way of seeing the world, their own worldview, God would have forgiven him. That's how he would have been healed. And yet they have to revert back to this old sin way, because it's the only way they can make the equation match up, right? It's the only way they can see well, make any sense of it. Now, I love this moment because this guy, he's, he's been a beggar his whole life. He's had zero power in society. He's been labeled a sinner or a person born in sin. He's been the lowest of the low, sitting at the gate begging every day. But on this day, when Jesus heals him, he stands up to the strongest force he's ever encountered. He stands up to the Pharisees and say, you guys don't even get it. You don't understand. You can't get out of your own way. You can't see that Jesus is from God, and you are trying to find excuses to blame him. This is a man who was nothing, and now is standing up because of his faith and love of God, because he has seen who Jesus is. His worldview, his old worldview, has been shattered. He no longer sees himself as just a sinner, but as a beloved child of God because of Jesus' actions. Because Jesus said love is more important than the rules. Love is more important than even the Sabbath day. Compassion for one another are what I came into the world for. To show love, to offer forgiveness, to teach a new way of being in the world. And this man gets it so fast and stands up for God. It's an amazing moment. All right, let's continue. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? This is the blind man speaking to Jesus. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. So right there, Jesus is trying to get through to them. That their way of seeing the world is broken. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It's not how God is calling them to be in the world. They are blind to who Jesus is. They're blind to what God is trying to do. Now, we as Christians, as people of the church, we get caught up in that sometimes, right? We get blinded by our way of explaining things. We get blinded by our own theology, our own faith, our own understanding. It's the very reason we had to have a, a reformation. It's the reason we continue to, to teach, to share, to learn, to remind ourselves that we can't, get, we can't get distracted by our own prestige. We can't get distracted by the rules we make up for ourselves, God's love is much more important than any label or any system we might slap on top of it, right? 
And that's what the Pharisees are blind to. They're blind to the fact that they've created a system that doesn't match up with what God is hoping will happen in the world. And everybody does this. This is part of the human experience. We see it happening in the world all around us, in our nation, in our nations, right? It's something that's happening in Ukraine right now. There's a, a worldview there that makes sense to Putin and the, and the Russians, right? They want to take over Ukraine. They think it's theirs, but it doesn't make sense to us in the West because we, we see a democracy as being the vital thing, right? They should be able to decide for themselves. These are different ways of viewing the world, and it's hard for us to comprehend, just as it was hard for the Pharisees to comprehend what Jesus was trying to teach them. We get caught up in seeing the world through one specific lens so often, because it's easier, is what it comes down to. It's easier to say, this is how it is, and now I get it, and that's all I need to know. I'm done. If I just live like this, things are good, right? We, we get that way all the time. In lots of different ways, in lots of different subjects, we get that way all the time. It happens in science. It took two generations for people to admit that germ theory was a real thing, right? It happens in religion mm, more often than I'd like to admit, and in more places than I'd like to admit. It happens in politics. We get caught up in having one way of seeing things, and we have a hard time turning when the world has already turned before us. This is just part of the human condition. So what do we do as people of God when we know we can fall prey to this kind of rigid thinking, right? Well, I think I know. All we have to do is remember what the most important thing is. And what is that, right? It's loving one another. It's having compassion. It's sharing. It's offering forgiveness. These are the foundational ideas within our faith that will help us whenever we hit these walls. If we can simply say to ourselves, I'm having a hard time with this, what do I do? They, they disagree with how I see the world, how do I respond? If we simply say, in love, we'll figure the rest out. It's when we don't respond in love that tragedy strikes. And that's clear throughout all of human history, religious, political, any of that. When we don't respond with compassion and forgiveness, people get hurt. It's clear in the passion narrative. That's what Jesus died on the cross for, to show people that love is more important. And as we move into the season of Lent, which is amazingly coming up this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, it'll be a good time to remember that, to remind ourselves of that. We walk, every year we walk on this journey with Jesus to the cross for that very reason. That God's love for us might be of central importance. That we can put aside all those things that distract us, all those lenses through which we see the world and say, no, this is the primary thing. This is the thing that will never steer me wrong. God's love that I might share that love with the world. Jesus had to go through a lot to get that across, and not everybody got it. For me, that's kind of the, one of the sadder things about this story. Not everybody got it. Even after Jesus died and came back, not everybody got it. And I don't, I don't make those people a villain. They're not villains. They're just doing the best they can in their situation. But you don't have to be a villain for bad things to happen, right? That's why it's so important that we hold on to that love. And I hope and pray you will. Amen. I'd like to invite you now to please rise for our hymn of the day. This is Christ to be our light, hymn 715.
Please be seated. We come now into the prayers of intercession. Let us pray. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Transform us by your greatness, O God. Send us down the mountain to share joy with all people. Make us agents, agents of change, confident that your hope will vanquish despair and your goodness will, con will conquer evil. God of grace, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. The mountains and valleys sing your praise. Dazzle us with your presence in every landscape. Bluffs built by ancient glaciers, canyons carved by flowing rivers, flat horizons with uninterrupted views, and sands shaped by ocean tides. God of grace, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. You love justice and establish equity. Strengthen leaders of local governments, community nonprofits, and grassroots campaigns. Bless them with gifts of integrity, creativity, and sound conscience. Build up safe and joyful communities where all people may thrive. God of grace, hear yeah, our prayer. prayer. Heal those who are in distress. Give patience to those waiting for answers. Grant hope to those who have reached the limits of treatment. Give compassionate hearts to those who accompany loved ones through illness and uncertainty. God of grace, hear our yeah, prayer. prayer. Today we shout Alleluia from the mountaintop. This week we enter the wilderness of Lent. Bless all who prepare and lead us in worship during this change of season. Pastors, deacons, musicians, and all who contribute to our worship life. God of grace, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For whom else do the people of God pray? Pray for Naomi, Lord. God of grace, hear yeah, our prayer. Okay. Blessed are they who listened to Christ's voice in this life and now rest with him. Transform us from glory into glory and give us peace that we do not lose heart. God of grace, Hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, God's peace be with you all. Um, we, it's getting to be a busy time of year at the church, so I have several announcements. So I don't know, pull out your pens and be ready to take notes, though most of it is in the back of your bulletin, you'll see. Um, the first one being, of course, this Sunday is the last Sunday of the month, so it's Drive Up Communion Sunday, and we are having our food drive up there, kind of in connection with our usual Super Bowl happenings. Uh, you'll see that many people have already brought in some food, but if you come to take communion or you get the opportunity, please drop off some food so that we can replenish our food pantry a little bit more. Um, as I said earlier during my servant sermon. We also have our Ash Wednesday service that will be here at Peace Lutheran Church at 7 p.m. This, of course, is a part of our Lenten uh, practice of doing ecumenical services with our partner congregations in Pendleton. Uh, you'll see the schedule uh, in the back of your bulletin there. It's all, it's in the nice big spread. Um, we'll, we'll be hosting the next uh, Holden service on the 30th here at Peace, but uh, well, I'll let you read. Um, <clears throat> I also want to draw attention to an upcoming youth uh, Youth Retreat Possibility. This will be May 20th through the 22nd. It's a retreat that's happening at Holden. So for you kids that are in high school, high school age kids, uh, you're all welcome. If you're interested, please let me know. Uh, we'd like to take a good group there. That would be a lot of fun. If you've never been to Holden, it's actually um, a converted copper mine or mining camp uh, up on Lake Chelan. It's where our Holden evening service that we sing every Lenten season comes from. It was written there for that place and has spread from the northwest to the rest of at least the Lutheran world, but I know beyond as well. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I also want to say, I do want to say a little something. We, uh, you probably will notice we are not doing our Shrove Tuesday pancake feed. Um, 
just with COVID and everything going on, it seemed like it would be a little too much to push that right now, but the scholarship committee, which this is their primary um, fundraising moment, is gonna be doing something else coming up, maybe around Easter time. They just have to get some details together, so keep your ears out for that, for our opportunity to help our college age kids. That would be great. Um, what am, oh, I also wanna draw attention to Beulah's 100th birthday, right? That's happening this Saturday. What time is that happening? Two to four, and is it kind of a revolving door? Just come in when you can, say happy birthday. All right, perfect. She's 100 years old. Can you believe that? <laughs> That's wonderful. 100 and a month. Oh, she's already, she's old. 100 is old news then. <laughs> but it's, I'm, it's wonderful we're able to celebrate with her. Um, oh, I almost couldn't read my handwriting. But speaking of birthdays, Wilma Arnold is, uh, is I won't say her age. She, she, it's her birthday today. Let's just say that. Um, can we sing happy birthday to Wilma? She's right here in the, in the rainbow shirt. I love it. Um, Sue, do you think you can lead us in a quick rendition? Um, which this... What? How, I, how did I miss that? We've got two birthdays. All right. So when we get to the names, uh, we're going to squish them both together, right? All right. Do your best. It'll be a mess, but I'll love it. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Congratulations, you two. That's wonderful. <laughs> All right. Um, that's a lot going on. Please, uh, please check out the announcements. That's on page 13 in your bulletin to, if you missed anything. But um, I think that's it. Let's continue by professing our... Oh, I've got a, a hand being waved in the back. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Yes, I didn't get an opportunity. Um, for the Lenten services, you'll, may, you'll notice on the schedule that there's no soup at 6. Um, not all of the congregations were comfortable doing soup, so we all decided this year we're just going to give the soup a miss. We're just going to have the services, but we plan to have, bring soup back next year. Okay? Hopefully this is the last thing we have to avoid because of COVID. Um, all right. All right, now let's profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd like to invite you now to please rise as you're able for the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give, give our, our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world, to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your, your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, be done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give, give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us, us our sins as we forgive, forgive those who sin against, against us. Save, Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. evil. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. forever. Amen. Uh, actually, keep standing. <laughs> um, just as a reminder, um, we're not quite there where we're going to start doing uh, communion at the rails yet, but hopefully soon. Uh, but we will be offering communion as people depart the sanctuary there, right in the fellowship hall. So at the end of the service, I'll go back there, and if you'd like to take communion, just come on up. Uh, for those at home, of course, at 11.15, we'll begin our drive-up communion service. So please pull into our parking lot, and we will serve you there. All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this gift of communion, this moment where we can encounter you in the bread and in the wine. Thank you for blessing us in our lives and in our hearts and helping us to see that you and your love are the thing that we must always remember, we must always focus on, that is of central importance. Amen. And now for the blessing. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together our sending song, Beautiful Savior, hymn 838.
Go with Christ into a weary world. Share the good news. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. You're welcome to depart or sing with us our postlude, This Little Light of Mine. Thank you.